This program is made possible by the friends and partners of Unspeakable Joy TV. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I'm looking this morning in the book of 1 Kings chapter number 17 and verse number 8. The question that I'm posing this morning is how to keep the barrel from going empty. How do you keep the barrel from going empty? In the book of 1 Kings chapter number 17 verse number 8, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. And he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks, and he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first and bring it unto me, and after make me make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of milk wasted not. Neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Now, Father, I pray that thy kingdom would come, thy will would be done. And it is in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this morning we're looking at the crown prince of the prophets. We're looking this morning at a man who thundered on the scene at the beginning of chapter number 17. A man that came out of nowhere, and the Bible says, and there came to, uh, came to Ahab the king, Elijah the Tishbite. And here come this man with fire in his eyes and... Uh, power in his soul and and, and love in his heart, but faith in his God. And he thunders onto the scene and as he gets down, all of a sudden God says after he does that to Ahab, he says, now I want you to go to the brook Cherith. Because down there at the brook Cherith, I'm going to provide for you with a raven. After the brook Cherith dries up, he then takes him and he goes and he says, I want you now to go to the area of Zidon, the area of Zarephath. And there I'm going to provide for you with a widow. And after this, he's going to go and he's going to have the showdown on Carmel. And after that, he's going to go out into the wilderness of Beersheba. And out there, God's going to provide for him with an angel. This man is a man that every day of his life, God supernaturally provided for him. 
Every day of his life, God supernaturally took care of his needs. Every day of his life, God took care of everything that he was going to need in order to get through that day. Now we look at where he's at right now at Zarephath. And as he's walking up the way, coming to Zarephath, the Bible says he gets to the gate of the city. And as he walks into the gate of the city, there's a little widow woman. And God says, that's her, son. That's the woman that I'm going to use to provide for you. He says, how do I know that? He said, go ask her to make you a loaf of cornbread. And he goes down and he says, ma'am, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to go and get me a drink of water. And she says, I can do that. She's going to go down to the communal well, and there at the well, she's going to dip down and get him a cup. But as she's going, he yells at her and he says, Now, man, wait one second before you go. I need you, when you come back, I need you to have a cup of water in one hand, and I need you to have a loaf of cornbread in the other hand. He said, I want you to make me a cake made out of meal. She says, Well, sir, I can't do that. And everybody knew Elijah. Everybody in Israel knew who that man of God was. She said, I'd love to do it. Everything in my heart wants me to be able to do it, but I can't do it. He says, why not, ma'am? She says, well, we're in the midst of a famine. We're in the midst of a time with no rain. We're in the midst of a time where there is nothing that is growing in the field, and all I've got left in my barrel is just a little bit of beaten up flour. All I've got down there is just a little wheat, a little flour, a little meal. She said, I don't even have enough for me and my son. I've only got enough for one loaf. And in that one loaf, I'm going to have to take it and cut it two ways and give him half, and then I'm going to have to take half, and then we're going to die. He said, ma'am, don't, don't worry about that. Do me a favor. You're not going to die. Go down there, get what you've got left in that barrel, scoop it out, make me a piece of bread, bring it to me. Then go back and reach in there again, and there's going to be enough in there for you and enough for your son. And as long as you do exactly what I tell you to do, and feed me and then feed yourself, he said, there'll always be enough. That barrel of meal will not waste. You're going to reach in there, and you're going to scrape up from the bottom, and you're going to find just enough meal to meet the need for that day. And when you think you've done all you can do that day, you're going to go back the next day and you're going to reach in there and God's going to supernaturally provide that day's meal out of that. And when you think you've exhausted that, he said you're going to reach in there again and you're going to find just enough for that day. And day after day after day you're going to go in there because you obeyed God and the barrel of meal is never going to go empty. Now beloved, I got me a little thought in that 930 service. I don't have it in my notes but I got to thinking about what that barrel of meal teaches us. It teaches us number one that God has empathy. We have an empathetic God. God cares. Now think about it. In Israel nobody cares about the widows. The king doesn't care about the widow and the prince doesn't care about the widow and the people don't care about the widow and the family doesn't care about the widow but there is a God in heaven that has his eyes on that little single mother and he looks at that little single single mother and says the king may not know where you are and the people may not know where you are but I've got my eyes on you and I'm going to provide for you when I don't provide for the king and when I don't provide for the people there's going to be a miracle that happens in your house that doesn't happen anywhere it teaches us that he's an empathetic God number two it teaches us about the exactness of God now he says here's what you're going to find every time you reach in there you're going to find that it's just enough to meet the need. It's exactly what you have got to have. It's not more than you've got to have. It's not less than you've got to have. But whatever you need at that minute, it is just enough. It's just sufficient to meet the need. Can I tell you why you and I rarely see the miracle of God? Because we're looking in the wrong direction. We're looking for God to send tidal waves of power. And we're looking for God to send tidal waves of unction. And we're looking for God to send tidal waves of provision. But He's not going to do that. You know why? Because God is not in the business of giving more than enough. He's in the business of giving you exactly what you need. Do you know why? Because He's a God that does not waste. And instead of us saying, God, why aren't you giving me more than I want? Why don't we say, Lord, you have taken need or taken care of my need in giving exactly what you need or what I need to have. But then number three, it sh- and I made this word up. It's not in the dictionary, but I made this up and I think you're going to understand what I'm saying. It shows us the enough 
toughness of God. It shows us that whatever that woman needed, it was just enough when she found it in God. What she found in God was just enough. When she was lonely, it was just enough. When she needed just a little bit for her and her son, it was just enough. When people came over, it was just enough. When she was up high, it was just enough. When she was down low, it was just enough. Here's what you're going to find out about the loving Lamb of God. He is just enough. If you're a single mother, He's just enough. If you're a divorced person, He's just enough. If you're a single person, He's just enough. If you're a college kid, He's just enough. If you're a young couple starting out, He's just enough. If you come to church by yourself, He's just enough. If you come to church as a family, He's just enough. Ladies and gentlemen, here's what I'm finding. No matter which direction I walk in, no matter which way I go, no matter where I turn, no matter how high I climb, no matter how far in the valley I go, I find He is just enough. He's always just what I need, right when I need it. I love that old song. He's an on time, in time, every time God. I'm finding my God shows up just when I need Him. And He shows up with just what I need and He shows it in just the way how I need it. He is an enough God. You say, but I face something big. You'll find He's enough. You say, I'm going up high. You'll find He's just enough. You say, I'm going out on a, bat, on a limb. You'll find He's just enough. He is an enough God. Now here is my point. She said, re, he said, reach in that barrel. It'll always be enough. And he looks at the people of God today and he says, the barrel will never run dry. Here's a question. Why don't we reach in the barrel more? Lord, have mercy. We act like God's on welfare stamps. We act like God's on spiritual food stamps. The Bible tells us no matter how many times she reaches in, we have a bad day and we feel like God's off the throne. We get upset one day and we feel like God's abandoned. Here is my question. What in the world is keeping us from reaching in the barrel? You know what it is? We're afraid each time we step out with God that when we reach in that time, it's going to be empty. How do you keep the barrel from running dry? I'm going to give you three little things this morning, and I don't know that you're going to like them as much as that 930 service liked them, but they enjoyed them pretty good, and I enjoyed preaching them pretty good to them. So if you don't like it, it's your fault, not mine, because they liked it, and I know that it's good stuff. So here's what I want to tell you. Number one, you've got to look at the typology of that barrel. If you don't understand what God's trying to teach you and I about that barrel, then you're not going to get the message of what God has put in His Word. You say, what is the typology? What does that barrel represent? What does that barrel stand for? Well, in that barrel there were two things. Number one, there was beaten mill. There was beat up flour. There was wheat that had been threshed down. There was wheat that had been separated from the shaft. And there was wheat that had been grind down. It had been picked. It had been pulverized. And it had been pressed out. And now it's in the bottom of that barrel. And every time she needs something, she goes to that which has been bruised. She goes to that which has been crushed. She goes to that which has been pulverized. She goes to that which can meet the need. She goes to that which is available. She goes to that which is able and every time she needs something because it's been beat down, pushed down, ripped to pieces, it's there. That is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, our Savior came out of heaven. He was plucked out of the realm of heaven, sat down on this earth of clay. He walked our streets of sod, but there on the lithostrotos there in the Antonia fortress, He was bruised by our transgression bruised with our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was laid upon Him. Our Father allowed your sin and my sin to be put on the shoulders of the loving Lamb of God and He was pushed down and He was beat down. He was bruised. He was crucified. He was buried but He rose up on that third day and here's what you're going to find. That pulverized meal, that's Jesus Christ. You know what that means? Whatever I need, He is the answer for whatever I need. Ladies Ladies and gentlemen, can I remind you right now that you and I have the only way to heaven. And it is the 
Lord Jesus Christ. You and I have the only pathway to eternity. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a pathway. It's not some pathway. It's not a way. And it's not some... I had a fool one time look at me and he said, well, sir, I look at heaven about like I look at going to Chicago. There's a lot of roads that get there. There's highways and super highways and you take your way and I'll take my way and we'll all end up in Chicago. He said, do you understand what I'm saying? I said, yes, but you're a fool. You know why? Because when I die, I'm not going to Chicago. I'm going to heaven. And there's only one way to get to heaven and there's only one path to get to heaven and it's the beat, bruised, pulverized son of the living God. And when you're a sinner, you'll find he's enough. And when you're outcast, you'll find he's enough. And the man with the withered hand found that he was enough. And the man that had the crippled legs found he was enough. And the man that was on the bed found he was enough. And the blind found he was enough. And the deaf found he was enough. Ladies and gentlemen, for everything you have, everywhere you go, every path you take, everywhere you operate in, he is the answer. He's not some answer. He's not a answer. He's not a gonna be answer. He is a right now Savior. He's a right now King. He's a right now Prince. He's our right now hope. He's our right now grace. What I'm trying to tell you is you won't find Him out there and you won't find Him out there. You'll find Him in here. He's Jesus Christ. You can look on the end of a bottle. You can snort it as hard as you want to snort it and smoke it as bright as you want to smoke it. But you'll find it's empty and it's vain and it's vile. But whenever you get hooked up to the loving Lamb of God and you get hooked up to the Son of the living God and you get doused in and hooked in and hopped on the Lamb of God, you'll find He's enough. He's enough to be your Savior in life. He's enough to be your way in death. He's enough to be your hope in eternity. He's enough. He is the beaten mill and He is that which is at the bottom of the barrel. Now, here's what you got to understand. That mill was not just beaten, but every day when she went, and she scooped out a handful of meal. She went back the next day. Now here's my question. Did she get all the meal out that time? Well, sure she did. Because there ain't no, but just a little bit in there. And I'm telling you, she got everything out. But when she went back the next day, was there some in there? Sure there was. You know what that means? It was perpetual meal. It kept multiplying. It kept growing. What's that a picture of? That is a picture of God providing for His people. What you have to understand is that Beryl is trying to teach God's people that He will meet our needs. Now I know, I know that you and I have always... We've asked God for things that He hasn't given do you know what that teaches me? We didn't need that thing. Somebody may pray for somebody to be healed and they go to heaven. Did they get healing? Well, sure they did. But not in the way we wanted it to be. Here's what you've got to understand. If I was God, I wouldn't give them just a little bit. I'd fill that bad boy up. And every time I reached in, I mean, I'd go clean down to my elbow. But that's not what God wants. You see, God wants to give just enough so that every day she had to have faith. She couldn't see it. She could only reach in. You see, that's what God's trying to show you and I. There are things that God will do and places God will call you to. And it's not going to be a supernatural provision every single day. It's going to be just enough to get by. Just enough to make it work. Just enough to meet the need. I'm telling you, the best way, I told this at 9.30, I'll say it at 11. The best way for a church to make sure that they always have enough to meet the need is to always be doing something for God. If a church will keep on reaching in that barrel and keep on trying to reach people for Christ and keep on trying to preach the gospel and keep on reaching in that thing to be a blessing to people and keep on trying to help kids and keep on trying to feed the poor and keep on trying to help the widow 
widow. Keep on trying to help the orphan. Keep on trying to help those that are broken. Keep on trying to build. Keep on trying to grow. Keep on trying to grow. The more you do, the more it will reproduce. You say, why am I not seeing that in my life? You ain't reaching in the barrel enough. You tell me the last time you really did something for God that required faith. Did He meet the need? Absolutely He did. He absolutely met the need. So here's the question. Why aren't you doing something else for God? And the reason we're not seeing the meal reproduce is we've stopped reaching in the blessed barrel. What God's trying to show people is we get to this place where we say, Lord, have I not exhibited enough faith? Yes, you have. But when you reach that point, you'll be in heaven and you won't need faith anymore. As long as you're on earth, you've got to keep trusting and keep reaching to the bottom of the barrel and you'll keep finding that God's exactly what you need Him to be. I could apply that in a thousand directions. But what I need you to do is look in your life. What are you reaching for to honor God? Because until you do, you ain't going to find at the bottom. Here's my question. Oh God, where is this coming from? Think about this. When did it reproduce? Did it reproduce as she took it out and closed the lid and it reproduced? Or did it reproduce as she was reaching in? I'm telling, I don't have an answer, but this is Tylerology. Here's what I'm thinking I'm thinking that it didn't reproduce. You know why? Because if she took that lid off and looked in and saw it, there's no faith. Some of you are just gonna have to take a step, some of you just gonna have to do it. Some of you, God's been telling you you can do it, telling you to go, telling you to make the move, telling you to do this, telling you to do this. And you're just going to have to say, Lord, fine, I'm taking the top off. There ain't nothing in that blessed barrel, but you told me to do it. So I'm just going to go on and reach down to the bottom of that bad boy. And when I do it, God will meet the need. Do you know why? Because He did it yesterday when she reached in there. And she did it the day before when He reached in there. And if He did it that day and the day before and the day before and the day before, why won't He do it today? That's the problem. You've got to reach in the barrel before you get to meal. Number two, let's look at the times of the barrel. Let's look at the times of the barrel. I don't know who paid the heat bill, but they got the bill right. I don't know who paid the bill, but God bless them. They paid it this month. I was going to say something. I ain't going to say that. No. Thank you, Jesus, for holding my tongue. You put a watchman at the gate of my mouth. Thank you, Jesus. I'm getting better. You, you said I need to get better, love. I got to get better about keeping my mouth shut. Thank you, Jesus. But it would have been funny. Say amen right there. But anyways. <laughs> all right, where was I, Heather, so we can edit this thing back in here? When did God provide the meal? When God provided the meal, you have to understand it was a certain time. God didn't just provide this meal at any time. What was going on in the Holy Land when God provided that meal? There's a famine. There's no rain. And if there's no rain, there's no what coming up out of the ground? Crops. And if there's no crops, there's no grain and flour. And if there's no grain and flour, there's nothing in the barrel. So here's the point. When you look around and you see how bad it is and you look in your life and you see and say, there's no way it could be brought. There's no way this could happen. There's no way this could be brought to pass. It's not possible. What you've just done is you've set the stage for the miracle of God in your life. Because miracles don't come when anybody else can get the glory. When you look around and say, there's no human way possible, that's the time to reach in the barrel. Beloved, I understand that the world's crazy. Half of y'all are crazy. I know they're crazy out there. 
I mean, the world's losing their mind. The government's losing their mind. Isn't that the time when God's going to send revival? When the world is rocking and reeling its way to hell and they're doing everything in their power to turn this thing upside down and they're doing everything in their power to turn over righteousness and turn over the ways of God. Isn't that the time when God says, watch out angels, it's about time for Papa to roll his sleeve up and to do the work that only God can do. Here's what I'm telling you. In your life, when you say there's no way it can happen. It's not possible. That's when God wants to move. Here's what I'm telling you. When you were lost in your sin, it was on that day when you said, I'm as low as I can possibly get. I can't get any lower. I can't go any further down. If I go any further, I'm going to be in hell itself. It was on that day at the lowest season, in the lowest hour, at the lowest moment, that our God reached out of heaven, reached down into the pit of sin, plucked you up out of hell, set your feet on a solid rock and saved you it's got to be a famine or it's not a miracle you do realize that when you pray for direction in your life and God gives you direction and the first thing you say is there's no way we could do that that is the direction you need to walk in when you pray and say God can I or will you and he gives it to you And you say, but Lord, there ain't no way we can do that. You are now in the vein that God wants you to be in. Because if God is not the only one that could bring it to pass, it wouldn't be a miracle. I look at people every day, and they say, there's no way I could, and they name it. And I say, that's how you know God will do it. Because God doesn't use things and people that other things and people can get glory from. God uses things and people that no other thing or people can get glory from. God takes a little little punk kid out of little Gibsonville who all he wants to do is shoot things and run fire hoses at stuff. And he says, now I want you to preach. And I look at him and say, God, there ain't no way I could preach. I don't know any preachers. I don't have any preachers in my family. I don't have any reverends anywhere near me. He says, I want you to preach. You know why God would call somebody like me to preach? Because you look at me and say, how in the world would God call somebody like him to preach? And when God uses somebody like me to preach to somebody like you, you look at somebody like me and say, if that guy is doing something to help me, it can't be that guy. He ain't smart enough. He's not finessed enough. He's not this enough. It's got to be something bigger than that guy. It's got to be something bigger than that one. Here's what you understand. When you reach the bottom and you reach the lowest point, that's when God wants to work. That's when God wants to move. Don't give up faith and don't stop reaching in the barrel just because it's not raining outside. Now here's a good one. And you need to understand this. I've never seen this until I was at the Atlanta airport the other day praying and studying this passage. This miracle, this barrel had a closing time. How many of you have ever heard this story preached about the barrel? Now come on people, there's got to be more than three of you that have heard this story preached. If you've been in church any length of time, somebody's preached on this passage. I've heard this I don't know how many times. And I've preached this, I believe. I don't, I've not preached this message, but I have, I have preached this before. And I've always heard until the other day at the Atlanta airport that as long as that woman obeyed and reached in, God would provide that meal as long as she reached in there for all the days of her life. I've heard that. I've said that. I've believed that. But that's not what the Bible says. I want you to look, if you will, in verse number 14. In verse number 14 of this passage, For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of mill shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. The day was coming when the rain was going to fall, and the barrel would no more be sustained by God. Brothers and sisters, let's apply this to the sinner. 
You do understand right now, if you've never been saved, you're not a real big church person, you're not a real big uh, religious person, you don't really care a lot about this whole thing, but you just came because somebody invited you. Hear what I'm getting ready to tell you. You do understand that in hell right now, there are no Buddhists, there are no Muslims, there are no atheists, there are no agnostics. Everybody in hell right now believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that He is the Savior of the world. You know the problem? They believed it too late. They believed it too late. Because there was a time when the mill would not be in the barrel. The day is coming and the judgment day is on the way. And you'll stand before the great white throne judgment. And when you lift up your eyes and see Him whose eyes are as a flame of fire and His hair is white as wool, girded up to the paps with a golden girdle and on His loins is written King of kings and Lord of lords. He's got blood up to His belly button. He's got hands that have been scarred, feet that have been scarred, a back that has been riveted and a crown that has been scarred around his brow with a beard that's grown back fresh as fire. When you look on him whom has been crucified, you'll believe. But it'll be too late. It'll be too late. You must trust in Christ today. If you don't reach in the barrel, Never find him sufficient. You look in that barrel. That's not impressive. It's just a handful of flour, but it was enough to meet the need. Jesus isn't the impressive God that the world would love him to be. He's not the God that rides in gold and silver. He's not the God that has kings and kingdoms on this earth and palaces and pomps and people. He's the lowly Nazarene. That came as God to be a servant so servants could get to God. He came as master and became a slave so that those that were slaves could go to the master. He was all, but he became nothing so that those which were nothing could become all. He was rich and made poor so those that were poor could be made rich. He was accepted by His Father, but rejected by men. So that those that are rejected by men could be accepted by the Father. He came as the Son of God, so the sons of man could become the sons of God. But the day will come when your opportunity closes. Seek ye the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the accepted time, the Bible says. If you've never been saved, I would run while the barrel has still got meal in it. But I want to apply this in another avenue. Before I go to my last little thought, here's the other avenue. Are you ready? The day's going to come. If she didn't reach in that barrel, it was going empty. Here's what children of God need to understand about serving God and walking in the ways of God and trusting God. Are you ready? Obedience has a window. And if you don't go through that window when it's open, you're not guaranteed that it'll be open again. When God tells you to do something, You're not guaranteed that if you don't do it at that moment, that it'll be opened up down the road. You can apply that in all areas of your life because God cares about all areas of your life. But walk with God today because tomorrow you may not be able to. Now I want to give you this third one. And I want to give you three words as I talk to you for a second on how to trust in the barrel. There's three words I want to tell you And I'm going to talk to the people of God. This is for the people of God this morning. Those are saved and called by God, redeemed by the blood. You say, how do I keep the barrel from running dry? Well, here's what you got to understand. The barrel's always going to have enough. The barrel's going to do its job, but she's got to do her job. The barrel's going to provide, but it ain't going to cook for her, and it ain't going to get out of the barrel for her. She's got to do her job. Now, how does she do that? Three words. Number one, priority. 
Notice what it says in verse number 13. In verse 13, the Bible says, And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do, but make me a little cake first, and then for thee and thy son. Ma'am, you got to provide for Elijah before God provides for you. Now, don't, 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 don't take this in a direction God doesn't want it to be. Elijah in the Old Testament, a prophet in that day, was a symbol of God. So the lesson is this. Take care of God's stuff first, and God will take care of your stuff after that. The verse I would give you would be in Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 33. Here's the verse. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these other things will be added unto you. Now, beloved, I could, we could apply that in a thousand, I could apply that to people that want to get married and you want to marry the right person. Alright? Here's the best way to do it. Follow Jesus and whoever's following Jesus with you is who God wants you to marry. It, you, I could apply that to business. Follow Jesus, take care of the things of God, walk in the ways of God, and God will take care of the rest of that thing. You say, but what do I need to do? I just told you. Walk with God, honor God, listen to God, follow God and everything else will just work out I could talk to you about that in finances I know y'all love it when preachers talk about money you think they're stealing anyway so let me go ahead and just tell it to you I've been doing this since I was 16 years old I didn't have any money at 16 but any money I had I learned I give God my part and God takes care of the rest I've, I've learned that now that God has been good to us and God's helped us and blessed us we do the same thing take care of God's part and God will take care of the rest. I've never lacked for a meal. It had not always been the meal I want. I've never lacked for clothes. But it's not always been the clothes I want. I've never lacked for shoes. not always been the shoes I want. One time I've got a story. I, I, I didn't tell this a while ago. I'll tell it right now. One, one time I was, uh, I was going to Israel for my first time. Somebody paid for me to go to the Holy Land the first time. How, all those years ago now. And, and I went and I, I said, God, there's... there's there's no way I can give this month and have anything to take to the Holy Land. And at that moment, my shoes, I, I had this thing about shoes. Well, if I ever find a comfortable pair of shoes, I wear them till there's holes in the bottom. I had a pair of Nike running shoes, or running, walking shoes. <laughs> it's because they say running, you can use those for dual purposes. Y'all know I, I take a prayer walk every morning. And I had those shoes for five years. They had a hole in the bottom of them. I just, I've always done that. And I needed a new pair of shoes to take with me to the Holy Land. And I knew there's no way I could give tithe. There's no way I could give and still have enough money to have any money to go to the Holy Land, especially to buy shoes. Well, I was sitting in, my, I was sitting in the kitchen at the old house one day and, and I was in there and we, we, we pay our tithes online and we, we gave our tithes and I sat there and I said, Lord, you're just going to provide. I don't even know. And I never really thought another thing about it. Well, I was sitting there one day and I got a phone call from a number I didn't recognize so I let it go to voicemail and I listened to the voicemail. And when I listened to it, I could tell the guy... It was a Saturday morning. The guy sounded, for all intents and purposes, sounded three sheets to the wind. And I'd have thought it was a prank call, except something the Holy Ghost said, call him back. It's what he said. He said, this is so-and-so. I own a shoe store here in town. And I've, been, I've heard about you. you got to understand, this has been six years ago. Nobody heard about Tyler except Tyler's family and a handful of y'all that came here. All right? And he said, I've heard about And if I'm lying, I'm dying. This is the truth is exactly as it happened. He said, I've heard about you. Call me back. I called him back. He gave me his name. He's not saved. I witnessed to him today. To this day, I try to win him to Christ. He, uh, he says, I want you to come out to the shoe market. He owns the shoe market out on West Friendly. We go out there. I, I, I go out there and I meet him. And I go in. He has no idea what I look like. He said, ask for, and he gave me his name. So I go in, and I said, I, I need to see so-and-so. He told me to come ask for him. He was the owner of the store. He comes out, he says, I heard about you at the Civitans. 
I don't know anybody in Civitans. I don't even know where Civitans is. He said, somebody was talking about you and said, you were the real deal. And I said, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I said, what was their name? He said their name. I've never heard of the person. I don't have a clue who it is. He said, and I heard you're going to the Holy Land. He said, and something told me that you need a good pair of shoes. You've got to understand, I ain't told a soul. You, I, I'm trying to, there is no, there's no, there's no sh- hidden strings on this story. He gave me, that day, gave me three pair of shoes worth $1,100. 1100 11, I'm wearing one pair today. I've had them resold. I've had them resold a hundred times now probably. And that day, God taught me a lesson. Take care of God's stuff, and God will take care of your stuff. The second word I want to give you is obedience. Obedience. Here's what Elijah tells her. He says, this is what I'm telling you to do. Do it. And you know what she does? She does it. You do understand that there's no way to obey God but just to do it. That's the only way to obey God is to step out and do it. Some of you have been visiting this church for months and months and months and God said, this is the church you need to join. You know what? They know the way to do it. Do it. Some of you, you've been asking God for a job and saying, God, I need a different place to work. And a job's opened up and you're trying to crunch all the numbers, trying to figure it all out. You know what you need to do? Just go do it. You've got to understand the only way to obey God is just to obey God. And there's a third word I'll give you because this is something I'd never seen until the other day. The third word is the word sharing. It's the word sharing. Can I show you something in verse, in verse number 15? I'm going to ask Ms. Kim, she's going to put this up on the thing because I want you to see this because I never saw this till I was sitting in Concourse A the other day. The Bible says in verse 15, And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and what? Did eat many... Wait a second. What did Elijah say? He said, if you'll feed me, you and your boy will always have enough. But what'd she do? She said, God, I'm just sitting here thinking... Every time I've reached in there for me and my boy, you give us exactly what we need. So I'm just sitting here thinking, God, if you do it for me and my boy, if I help other people, would you do it for them? She said, here we go, Lord. And honey, she gets her sleeve and she says, my mama and my daddy are coming over and they hadn't had food in a couple of days. And man, she reaches her hand down the bottom and as soon as her little hand hit the bottom of that barrel, she was absolutely shocked. You know what she found? When she wanted to give it to her, she had enough. And when she wanted to give it to her son, she had enough. And when she wanted to give it to her daddy, she had it. Yeah, son, I'd say it now. When she wanted to help out her mama, there was enough. When she wanted to help out her cousin, there was enough. Here's what I'm telling you. You need to give it to God. Give it to the people. When God uses you, you use, let God use you as a channel. Don't be a palm that hogs it all. Be a river that God can stream through, that God can flow through, that God can roll through, that God... You bless other people and God will bless you. That's just the way God works. Back in, uh, back in March... When everybody shut down, the world lost their mind. Businesses shut down, people shut down, things shut down. Restaurants shut down, doctor's offices had to shut down. Hair salons shut down, everything just shut down. In March, God told me, it's time to take the TV ministry and separate it from the church. The church has borne the burden long enough. We're going to separate it out and it's going to be self-sustaining. I've told you the story about how I I said, we'll give it away, we'll give it away, we'll give it away and God would provide. Back in March, we got a, uh, a letter in the mail. A man here in town that owns a used car lot over off of Randleman Road. And in that 
envelope he sent a thousand dollars. Didn't really think a lot about it. I was thankful, but I didn't think a lot about it. The next month, April, he sent a thousand dollars. It got my attention a little bit. Then in, in May, he sent another thousand dollars. And then he gave, I think that month he gave another five hundred dollars. So one day I went out and saw him. I kind of wanted to know the story. I, I didn't know the guy. I, I'd never met him, never heard of him. So I went out and I wrote him a letter. And I wrote him a letter and I just said, I just want you to know, I appreciate what you've done. So I go out there and he wasn't there. But his guys were there. This is in May. And I took him the letter. So I gave the letter and they said, well, he's not here, but if you... Uh, if you, if you want to, you can wait around. I said, no. I said, I've got to go. I've got some other things I need to get done. Got to get back to the church. When I got back to the church that, that morning around lunchtime, he was waiting. I didn't know who he was. He was waiting here at the office. Well, we get a lot of people that come by, and uh, a lot of times that there's no telling what they'll need. It can be... I've had people everything from they needed to get saved to they wanted to know if I bled when they cut me. I mean, I've had it all. You know, we, we've had it all. And uh, so, normally what happens is when I hear a door shut out in the park, I'll shut my door. And I'll make everybody else take care of it. I don't, they ain't going to kill Heather. Y'all know that. Don't even, don't get that sanctimonious grin on your face. But for some reason... As the Holy Spirit said, open the door. So I opened the door and I let the man in. He told me who he was. I realized at that moment who he was. and He said, I just got to tell you a story. I got to tell you a story. I got to tell you a story. I said, all right. He said, back in March, our church shut down. And, and so we were looking for something on TV or something. And he said, I was looking for Charles Stanley. And I found you. And I said... All right? He said, uh, and I watched you and something just gripped my soul. It reminded me of being a boy in church. He said, so I tuned in the next week and something that week said, give some money. He said, and I normally would give to Dr. Stanley, but I, I gave it to, to you. And um, he said, normally, normally in a month, he said, we sell about 20 cars a month. In good, hot seasons, we sell 20 cars a month. He said that month we sold, in, the, in March, in the quarantine, we sold 30 cars. He said, son, I'm old. He said, I've, I've been doing this a long time. He said, so I wrote another check. He said, in the whole month of April, we sold 40 cars. He said, and then in the month of May, when I wrote the check, something told me to write another check that same week. And he gave double that month. He said, and this was in May. He was in shorts, and he's in a t-shirt. And I said, well, you, you, don't you need to go back? He said, no, we're not open. This was the second week in May, and he said, we've sold 55 cars in the first two weeks of the month. And he said, we're out of cars. We had to shut down because we're completely out of cars. And he says, what did you know? Because I learned how to bless others. God has blessed me. And I'm looking at people today that God is wanting so badly to pour out the blessing of God. And it's not always financial blessing. We're American. We think that the only thing that lives and breathes is the dollar. Sometimes God can bless you with good health. Sometimes God can bless you by not letting your old car break down. Sometimes God can bless you by a certain bill that doesn't come out. Here's what I'm telling you. You bless others. And every time, <laughs> God, you could reach in the barrel, you pull out just enough for that day.
Thank you for watching this broadcast of Unspeakable Joy with Pastor Tyler Galden. Our prayer is that you have been challenged and changed by the power of God's Word. Unspeakable Joy is only able to broadcast through the regular prayers and financial support of people just like you. Would you consider becoming a monthly partner of Unspeakable Joy? You may mail your gifts or you can give online at unspeakablejoytv.com. Be assured that God's Word has the answer for your every need, that you may rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory.